constitutional position of Hindus, ineffective or non-existent cultural, religious and educational rights. So if you recall the three institutions, right, they closely tie into these three, schools, temples and family. But in terms of the interpretation and application by the courts and also by the numerous laws that have been made by various state and central governments, it's all you know, translated into only laws and acts and judgments against, at least the majority of them are against the Hindu religion. Control of these three institutions if Hinduism as a dharmic society should, you know, needs to survive and grow. Explicitly for our community only and there are certain deficiencies, please take them away. So here also we are saying the same thing, you know, let it be, let it not be appropriated for promotion of any religion. Thanks everyone, uh, like she said, I'm uh, Hari Prasad. I work in the software industry in uh, Bangalore. So over the past uh, few years, uh, we had the opportunity to study some of these uh, areas related to discrimination of uh, uh, Hindus from various perspectives. And uh, from a legal and constitutional perspective, though that's not my domain, uh, you know, in terms of my work, uh, that interested me more because this seems like the most foundational element um, and, and the biggest damage I think for uh, discrimination against Hindus is coming from uh, what's encoded in our constitution. So that interest led me to, uh, you know, uh, explore and study this field a little bit more. And over the past year, we had the opportunity to work with Srijan Foundation and various other people uh, in coming up with this uh, Hindu Charter of Demands. And uh, the first of those demands uh, is clearly the need for amending um, four or five of the articles of our constitution. So this talk is about that, you know, why we are asking for uh, uh, some fundamental changes to some of the critical uh, articles of our constitution. A number of people have, uh, you know, contributed to making this slide set and, you know, we've presented it in various forums. So I have the opportunity here and, uh, you know, thankful. So I'll go through the slide set first 40, 45 minutes and then we can have, uh, you know, based on your questions, we can have a discussion. Uh, before we get to the actual uh, details of each article and then you know what the issue with each of those uh, are and then what change we are asking, I'll just take three or four minutes maybe uh, trying to explain why the handicap introduced by you know these articles are especially uh, troublesome for Hindus. So you know this is about a case for removal of constitutional disparity. So uh, some of this is theory, of course, so that's why I'll skip through very, very fast. But we all know, you know, you know, when we talk about Hindu, we are also, you know, talking about the greater uh, the, uh, set of dharmic, uh, you know, uh, religions, so to say. Uh, so the, the discrimination is actually about, uh, against all uh, sects and subsects of, you know, uh, the, the dharmic tradition. And of course, uh, Sanatana Dharma says, um, serve dharma so dharma shall protect you which means every person at the individual level at the group level at the governmental level needs to first give to dharma to expect dharma to you know uh, protect it and you know give back that is like the fundamental philosophy which almost all of us you know by now know so uh, i mean where does this come from where does this uh, you know what is the philosophy behind this uh, our philosophy you know believes that man is inherently an interdependent being and, and this is where the, you know, I have a next slide which compares our philosophy with the prevalent philosophy of the day, where we say we are an interdependent being, whereas the prevalent notion is that we are independent beings. So I think that's where the basic difference uh, in terms of what the constitution uh, achieves to grant and what we actually want comes from. So we are dependent on a number of things, other, you know, fellow humans, nature, society overall. Uh, and therefore, I can make a case for myself by actually helping, being of help to others. You know, that's the premise. If I give, I, I qualify to get, okay? So therefore, a dharmic society is a society of give and take in that order. And of course, the premise of modern cultures, which is what reflects in our constitution also, is about, you know, a rights-based society. So uh, the moment an individual is born, he is guaranteed certain rights, you know, and then everybody else has to work towards making that happen to that particular individual. So it's, you know, fundamentally orthogonal. 
and and these privileges and these rights are inviolable in the sense irrespective of the contribution of the individual forget contribution but e even if the individual is harmful to society he is still guaranteed those rights i mean we have multiple cases from the past uh, decade or so where even you know hardcore criminals you know there is there are petitions to you know let them free or at least spare them from the gallows and so on right so that is all you know derived from this uh, belief so the conflict between the dharmic and liberal approaches is that you know uh, dharmic society expects individual to approach with a sense of duty whereas the prevalent notion is that we approach it with a sense of entitlement clearly they are you know contradicting so because our basic premise is harmony with fellow humans so if we give and take then there's harmony between uh, individuals and in groups and societies and so on whereas the the uh, first result of a rights based society is that it instigates conflict with others because obviously everybody can't get the same right i mean there's a limit there's a pie and then there's a limited share that everybody can get but you're guaranteed the whole so one man's rights are another man's obligations we have seen numerous laws in this country where you know the burden is transferred from one section of society to the other there are numerous excuses and you know in some cases justifications but but it is true that it's a transfer of burden so that and and that is not what a dharmic society is so it it actually insists upon a sense of sacrifice and enjoyment and therefore the the basic point i wanted to make about all the i mean these three four slides is that such a mindset when we say we want to you know cultivate a dharmic society we want to be a dharmic uh, nation and so on and so forth whatever we are saying whatever lakshanas as we call it whatever attributes that an individual or a group should uh, develop it cannot be imposed you know it has to be it has to come from within that is like the fundamental problem with why rights based approach will not work for us so it's difficult to impose and therefore at least three institutions become critical for us you know now uh, many will argue and i'm sure some of you also may share that uh, outlook that when i uh, talk about these three institutions in the next slide uh, that it is important for all religions you know i'm talking about schools and temples and you know uh, family but it is especially important for a dharmic religion that's the point i'm trying to make and perhaps if you have some kind of a hierarchy of what is important this is number 1 for us because like i said you cannot impose you cannot give a checklist or a you know a cheat sheet and say just follow all of these you know five times a day you do this and once in your lifetime you go there i mean we we do have all of that but that's secondary you pick up for example the smritis of uh, any rishi i mean we have a ton of them all of them talk about the the lakshanas of dharma you know what how can i identify you know whether an individual is dharmic or not the surprising thing is almost none of them talk about uh, devotion or uh, worship of god i mean this may come as surprising to you but you know you i don't want to, uh, to highlight about what manu says on this that's like a, a difficult smriti to talk about but you take any other smriti bhakti or worship archana etc they do not figure in the list of the main uh, lakshanas or attributes of dharma I mean, we have asteya, we have satya, we have kshama, we have dhairya, and so on. I mean, each person differs, but those are fundamental qualities that an individual has to, you know, uh, develop and express. The others, which are important, they are secondary. So they are in terms of, uh, you know, uh, they we need to do them in order to help develop these primary attributes. So uh, in that way, I mean. very strictly speaking a dharmic society need not even be religious and and we have tons of examples right we also include some uh, atheist philosophies in our list of darshanas and so on because the basic premise comes from that so because of this uh, because the focus is not on the uh, you know the rituals part or the you know following of rules part these things need to be cultivated and practiced so we need to educate people we need to help them in leading a uh, dharmic uh, lifestyle and we need instruments to propagate this okay so therefore those three requirements translate into control of these three institutions you know schools temples and family we need control of these three institutions if hinduism as a dharmic society should you know needs to survive and grow and leading from that 
what is the current reason in my opinion for what we call as the dimitude uh, this is a term i think uh, we use uh, very frequently in all our presentations and you will see that uh, subsequently as well here uh, so what is the reason primary reason for uh, this lack of, i mean this dimitude or um, you know this lack of uh, pride and confidence is because we don't have control over these three institutions so again here you know there there may be a question that crops up you know because uh, there are thousands and thousands of hindus running schools and we have hundreds of thousands of temples so what do we really mean by control of these institutions so the remainder of the slide set is actually about that while we do run these institutions in one way or the other we don't really control them in the sense of you know what we can do what we can teach and you know uh, whom we teach and so on and so forth so basically dimitude is you know loss of knowledge lack of pride and thereby lack of confidence so this is a three typical symptoms you'll see with the, any dimi in hindu uh, you know nowadays so it has of course multiple angles i mean uh, it's an there's a problem with education there's a problem with how we are progressing as a society and uh, there's some political angles to it and so on there is also a constitutional and legal angle which is what the remainder of my slides are going to focus on so is hindi hindu dimitude encoded in the constitution so yes so we start our constitution starts with the premise uh, of equality you know absolute equality so to say uh, through article 14 it says the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law so this is like when you uh, in that specific subsection where we have started to talk about individual rights in the constitution this is the first one and here we are declaring that everybody is equal and there are no ifs and buts in this clause and then the remainder of that subsection of the constitution is all about the exceptions and that's where we have the problem so where did this come from i mean before we get into those specific problem areas you know what is the reason for this uh, discrimination obviously 19 i think there was uh, i mean there's been a there was lot of work in the 1930s uh, during the round table conferences and so on which kind of served as input material for our constitution and and many other conferences and discussions with various um, uh, sections of society various leaders but i think around the 1945 46 is when the constituent assembly got formed i mean some precursor work to that in the formation of the constituent assembly and then 1950 of course you know we became a republic and the constitution came into effect so those five four five years were you know the years when the actual uh, the, the crux of the work happened for writing our constitution and coincidentally uh, of course the partition also took place at that time and uh, so that was a big factor so if you look at all these constitutional assembly debates and the various committees that were formed the subcommittees that were formed and the deliberations in almost every single um, committee and in every single issue that they were trying to analyze the issue of minority rights uh, rights and issue of uh, protection for minorities that was a major factor in some sense rightly so because obviously there was concern and especially in the 40 i mean after the independence the immediate aftermath and given the violence and the number of people who died and so on this became a big concern so the concern was very genuine but the way it has translated you know and 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 you know it's it's become like a anti pattern document so to say you know it started to have the opposite effect of what it was meant to have but that was the background so there were explicit minority rights encoded you know in various articles and in many places the makers of the constitution actually talk about you know how the hindu society the majority community uh, will actually take care of take care of itself so one thing you will notice in all those debates and discussions is there was never any problem uh, in discussing about majority and minority there was always open discussion so uh, you know people talking about religion people talking about what is needed for my religion and your religion and you know hindu and muslim it's splattered all over the discussion so there was there was no taboo talking about uh, these issues because obviously they they accepted the truth on the ground that it's an important factor you know uh, in, in in during the formation of the nation unlike now where you know some of us are having challenges even talking about the hindu charter of demands because you know oh, how can you talk on a, a religious basis but hey the whole constitution itself talks on that basis that's what we are trying to highlight and uh, you know help um, or or try and correct 
so uh, so they actually uh, stated that the hindu society can actually take care of itself we are always going to be a majority in india you will have the power through you know the votes and you know you'll get the government of your choice you get whatever you want that is like a basic assumption and i think the previous video by uh, shri mohandas pai ji beautifully brought out brought out that uh, problem now how it is actually not translating into you know the the assumption under this uh, declaration so almost nowhere in the constitution there is anything explicitly declared for hindus and uh, you know the other thing to go along with this is the makers of the constitution many of them were um, you know uh, like me in a sense you know did, you know do not have a deeply i mean i or, or a position of authority to judge on religious and spiritual matters they were lawyers they were political leaders and you know various economy economists and so on all of them got together and took up this role of you know we'll reform hindu religion and that also again features prominently in the discussions and it led to many um, clauses so what is the current constitutional position of hindus ineffective or non existent cultural religious and educational rights so if you recall the three institutions right they closely tie into these three schools temples and family articles 25 to 30 specifically of the constitution heavily loaded against the hindus and therefore you know it imparts stepmotherly treatment and systematically over time our institutions are weakened so the first factor here only hindus are deprived of control over their temples and religious affairs so we'll get to two articles out of the articles between 25 to 30 the first uh, we will go slightly in the reverse order just to emphasize the point article 26 freedom to manage religious affairs so every religious denomination or any section thereof shall have the right to establish and maintain institutions for religious purposes manage its own affairs and to own and acquire property and administer such property in accordance with law so there is no clear definition of what is a religious denomination it's a western concept that we have borrowed in the ideal sense it should have translated into every subsection every pantha or every creed that we have even in the hindu fold and that should have been identified as a religious denomination and therefore all of those you know the vaishnavas or the smartas or the aghoris for example and so on every single subsect which has uh, a unique um, uh, you know identification to it and unique practices that should have been called out as a denomination that's not the case and then to go with this we have a we have article 25 which you know uh, the first part at least is kind of neutral it says sub- subject to a couple of things morality health and public order each person will have the freedom of conscience and the right freely to profess and practice and propagate religion so everybody has the right to practice religion but then this section the the class 2 under that article and then the two sub classes under that bring in a lot of restrictions and allow the government to exercise a lot of control so it says the state shall not be prevented from regulating or restricting any economic financial political or other activity which may be associated with religious practice and then there's a competition actually between class a and class b here on which is more damaging the second one says providing for social welfare and reform of the throwing open of hindu religious institutions of a public character now over time this second sub class has been again in terms of interpretation split into two parts so they say providing for social welfare and reform now that's the way the courts interpret one part so the constitution gives us that right we can you know go in for social welfare and reform and then also of course the opening up of the hindu religious institutions class a here Uh, regulating or restricting any activity right there is a healthy amount of debate during the formation of the constitution and they cited many examples where you know religious institutions religious gurus and some of these babas and all were misusing their position and you know basically making money and running um, other stuff non religious stuff so they said how do we control if we give unrestricted freedom to practice religion then how does the state interfere if you know somebody is like you know profiteering or you know exploiting people that was the basic uh, premise behind putting in this clause but that's been forgotten now so what it says is you know the state can enter and it can control all of these activities 
Also, the other angle to this was they said, you know, uh, if let's say I'm running a temple, obviously there'll be in, you know income, there'll be money coming in, and I'll be spending, uh, you know, on, on on the needs of the temple, and that's uh, fundamentally economic and financial in nature. But that is not what was counted here. So, you know, the, the the regular financial or economic activity to sustain the institution is not what was meant here. If you are doing, for I mean, there's a clear example. I think one of the examples is somebody says in the debates, if somebody runs a lottery, for example, in a temple, you know, or a Baba, he runs a you know Ponzi scheme, and under the garb of the you know mutt or institution, that is what they wanted to prevent over here. So it is when when they say which may be associated, it actually meant apart from the religious practice, but that is not how it is interpreted now. So even the the seva amount that we go and offer in a temple, because it's you know it's obviously money, it's currency that's being counted as a economic and financial activity, and so the state has the right to enter and control. So that is kind of a distortion of the intent of the constitution makers. So how can a secular government control and manage religious places that too of only one religion? Now there may be one question here. In those two articles, there's nothing. Uh, specific about Hindu, right? Except the last portion about Hindu religious, I mean Hindu uh, temples. But in terms of the interpretation and application by the courts and also by the numerous laws that have been made by various state and central governments, it's all, you know, translated into only laws and acts and judgments against. At least the majority of them are against the Hindu religion. So, the, you know, based on how it's transpired, we can safely say that this is actually happening only for one religion the Hindu religion. This is of course explainable, I mean acceptable if we were a Hindu Rashtra, you know, you know, obviously there are people suddenly cite examples of the Vijayanagar kingdom and various other kingdoms where the kings on a daily basis used to uh, interfere, meddle and run the affairs of temples. But we are not a Hindu Rashtra, you know, uh, we, are, we are a so-called secular nation, so then how can we do this? So the other angle to look at this is, I mean, this is like a weak angle, but we wanted to call it out. If you want to meddle in the affairs of religious institutions, then, you know, you, 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 I mean, it's okay if it's, it's a little bit better if you meddled equally with the institutions of all religions, but that again is not happening. So it cannot pick and choose over only Hindu temples. So what has this resulted into loss of pride? You know, is it that we cannot manage our temples? This is again, those who believe that Hindus cannot manage temples, this is question number one that we hear saying who will, you know, uh, manage it. We have a slide or two on that and we'll discuss a bit about that. But we manage so many other institutions, I mean, and we've been doing this for like thousands of years, like well, suddenly to declare that, you know, post-independence, suddenly we are incapable of managing temples, uh, or we'll, you know, because uh, people are corrupt and uh, mismanagement and so on. But that should have been the case with every kind of institution that a Hindu runs today. So you see the result of state control of uh, you know Hindu religious affairs. I mean, there's so many examples. In week, week after week, we hear about this, right? The the you know Thirumala Thirupati uh, priest controversy. There are actually multiple angles there. Um, you know, prevention of chanting of mantras in some temples and so on. Commercialization of many temples. The various Sevas, based on the money that you can give, you can get a different kind of a treatment in the temple and then people go there only for those uh, pujas and so on. Misuse and misappropriation, this is like the biggest you know, uh, effect of this, uh, especially in South India where the almost all the sou uh, southern Indian states have these laws controlling temples, this is one big side effect that, or, or maybe the main effect of uh, you know this rule. We simply do not know what uh, quantity of land as you know temple land has gone off so it's it's strange to i mean it's a real contrast right for thousands and thousands of years you pick up any uh, you know history material related to bharata you will see that kings actually donated lands granted lands to temples and now we have the opposite since the last 70 years where these lands are being taken away and nobody knows where they are going and various other issues as well, you know, they are actually not managing it well, that's the summary. You know, it was, governments were meant to take over temples so that they can rid the temple of the problem of management and they aggravated the problem. 
and the last one is also especially serious appointment of non hindus in temple boards as temple employees and this is happening in you know few of the biggest temples you know most uh, precious and most holy temples for us the tirupati for example there is a big controversy going on so dharma dies without temples you know they are the life and soul of our dharma so today it has become like a, i would say in in many of these temples right run by uh, government it's as if you are running a museum or a library i mean there's a certain stated uh, you know function on paper and that's what happens so they would have appointed some people i mean so it needs to be clean there needs to be one um, uh, archaka and then there'll be certain timings and you'll do some pujas all of that is fine but that's almost elementary in any temple our temples served numerous other purposes all of which are being discounted now so uh, it has deprived us of the institutional capacity for self correction self defense and organic growth of religious leadership so because it's like notionally running so many of these temples there's no real organic growth from within and and the uh, religious and spiritual output from these temples are not up to the mark therefore we must gain control our over our temples uh, again so as a result of all of this material what we are asking for demanding uh, as part of our hindu charter the first of the you know sub demands under point 1 is that we amend article 26 to restore the temples to hindus you would recall that there is a phrase in the current article which says for any other non religious activity state can interfere what we are asking for is not withstanding anything contained in any of those articles the state shall not control administer or manage any institution established for religious purposes you know explicitly take back this right that the state has given there are numerous other laws tax laws you know criminal laws and so on which are actually sufficient which are enough to take care of problems with corruption and mismanagement and we don't have similar laws for uh, you know commercial entities commercial organizations right so the same thing can apply and then a couple of sub points just to make sure the the uh, withdrawal of the states right is complete you said all laws in force in the territory of india will be void at this point so for example we have many state governments which have these uh, hrc acts hindu religious and charitable endowment acts through which they take over temples so then there there will be a, like a small legal loophole saying will the existing laws continue to work and so on so that's why we make it, we make it explicit saying none of those will be va- you know valid anymore and in future also the state shall not make any law to take over so that's the sum and substance of this demand Uh, take back your i mean uh, withdraw your right uh, void all existing laws and you know you shall not have the right to make any laws in future so what happens how to fill the void if the state withdraws so this is like a favorite question of those who don't like this proposal you know who takes care actually there are various angles um, in many of the south indian states right when the state actually takes over it is actually coming in as just a uh, the, the supreme authority there in terms of the management committee of the temple and the people who are involved in involved in the day to day administration they actually remain the same but every single action that they take is subject to the control and approval and permission of the uh, government and therefore in 90% of the cases this question is actually you know void or moot because there are people who have been traditionally managing and whether it's the village or the town people have an arrangement there to manage the temples only in some big temples the state has really completely taken over and you know many of them are government employees and so on so there this question is valid and what we are saying is the the central government has the power to interfere in this matter because administration of religious space places is on the concurrent list which means both the state government and the central government can make laws related to this so the center could enact a law taking best practices from some existing acts that are there and it can give a framework for management so for example if you see the related to education right we have the rte right to education act it's similar in nature it's a concurrent subject and the rte act passed by the central government gives a framework and then each state government has made its own rules and regulations you know derived from it and you know, based on local needs so the same thing actually uh, can work for uh, temples if needed so i think i've covered this in my previous thing so there's a number of benefits and basically it will restore our pride and confidence and we can use temples for many other purposes dharmic purposes 
So the second topic, you know, uh, the state has become the biggest proselytizer by encouraging conversion of Hindus by misuse of public funds, etc. This may sound a little uh, alarming or shocking to say, but that's kind of the reality of, uh, you know, what's transpiring. So we have Article 27 in the Constitution, which says this. No person shall be compelled to pay any taxes, the proceeds of which are specifically appropriated in payment related to any uh, religious activity, the promotion or maintenance of any religious activity. So this actually bars the state because it is, you know, self-declared secular nation. Actually, you know, if, uh, the, if it is interpreted in the spirit of what this was meant to be, the state cannot spend its money, the money collected from the public on any particular religion or religious denomination. But then again, they have gotten clever here. So you, you see this word here which says specifically appropriated in payment. So the interpretation of this is if I'm actually, you know, collecting a new tax, let's say I impose tax A from today and say this is going to be spent on masjids and churches, but then I collect it from all uh, citizens of India. So the interpretation is in that case, that particular tax collected is specifically appropriated for a religion or so. And therefore, you know, they'll happily say that's not allowed. But as long as this is coming from some pool where we are all paying taxes and it just goes into one consolidated fund and nobody knows how it's being split, they are saying it is not specific appropriation. Therefore, this is not applicable. So that's like a creative interpretation of this clause to do, you know, whatever appeasement that has to be done. So the consequences of ambiguity is, you know, false narrative of minoritism is created. The main thing is here, yeah, the minority politics and appeasement by misuse of public funds to the detriment of majority. So what, I mean, there are multiple angles here, right? One is the whole financial angle only. We have a department of minority affairs in the center and, you know, many state governments, numerous, numerous uh, policies and acts uh, targeting minority religions and, the you know, the, the uh, corresponding majority act or the benefit is not there, whether it's uh, scholarships, whether it is uh, um, easy access to uh, loans, reduced interest rates, um, you know, many other many other forms of appeasement budgets. I mean, they, they have a separate minority commission and minority ministry and separate budgets and so on uh, by mis misinterpreting Article 27. So one is the uh, tax angle and the money. I mean, the secular st state is spending. The second thing is, we have declared ourselves to be secular. We want that notion of, uh, you know, religion-based treatment to go away. But then you create policies and, you know, schemes based on religion. It will only deepen the sense of, you know, religious identity from a consumption of public goods perspective. So, for example, uh, you know, we have this, uh, the, the first point that we are talking about here, right? There was this uh, Sachar committee report and as a result of that, various schemes were um, created uh, targeting uh, minority uh, communities. One of them says that uh, wherever there are, uh, con you know, minority concentrated districts, I think it's called MCDs, you know, a particular region, they have some geographical specifications for that. If the percentage of minorities is greater than 25 or something, then there are special schemes, which, which includes, you know, things like uh, uh, you know, focus on creating roads, street lights, uh, easy access to loans in that area and so on. So multiple issues with this. First of all, if you create schemes targeting, you know, concentrated areas, people are going to concentrate more when I mean, it's easy access to resources there, right? And secondly, it deepens. I mean, the money, something like a road or a street light or, or, or a bank loan is a public good. There is no religious identity or a religious tag in that. Each of us based on needs and, you know, whatever other non-religious criteria should be equally uh, you know, qualified to apply for that and get it. But this is specifically targeting that. So it can only deepen the sense of uh, communal identity in the country if we go this route. I think that's the bigger problem with this, uh, uh, this approach. So obviously the electoral politics and, you know, voting as a block is a, a big factor. And even BJP falls into this trap. I mean, the reason we put this is uh, uh, numerous of these schemes are still continuing. Some new ones have been added. Uh, so so uh, there is a sense of uh, um, a discord there and there is a sense of, uh, you know, what is being stated and what is being done. There is some you know, uh, disconnect there. 
and therefore the net result of this is you know state incentivizing and encouraging conversion of hindus to get these benefits so this may again sound a little strong but that's the reality right i mean if you go down this path and make uh, availability of public goods easy if you belong to a certain set of religions i mean unlike caste for example right you can actually convert from one religion to the other so in some sense this is actually encouraging that it may be slow it may happen over a long you know time or whatever or it may not even happen even the sense of you know lack of uh, confidence and lack of pride that the majority community feels saying you know we are not i mean the state thinks that we are not uh, deserving of this that itself is enough that itself is like dissent in incentivizing at least if you are not incentivizing the actual you know uh, move so when the state patronizes minorities so much and thereby encourage you know encourages how is it different from missionaries or you know any others in their character so how is it doing it things differently has the constitution even inadvertently envisaged such a type of state so there's not even a hint of you know uh, such a uh, wish uh, in you know from our makers of our constitution they simply did not want this i mean the, the, those clauses were not meant for serving such purposes so the second demand is you know amend article 27 make it explicit no money is out of the consolidated fund of india or of a state shall be appropriated for advancement or promotion of any section of citizens so again if you see you know the first and the second demand also it's very very neutral and that's a point we want to emphasize in the end also we in, in this section in this demand of the hindu charter we are not asking anything explicitly for our community only and there are certain deficiencies deficiencies please take them away so here also we are saying the same thing you know let it be let it not be appropriated for promotion of any religion so this will end the politics of appeasement uh, obviously i mean if you if the state simply cannot do then you cannot promise anything now they promise because at least a portion of it can be implemented and therefore it will bring in much needed religious neutrality okay and thereby you know this restores the pride and self confidence at least stops the disincentivizing like i said limitude number 3 so deracination of hindus to self loathe and disown their own religion culture and history so there are a bunch of articles we'll quickly go through them and then we'll get to some points about how this is leading to deracination of hindus so uh, article 155 was introduced in uh, 2005 you know there was this famous judgment in 2002 uh, related to educational institutions and uh, i think it was a laven judge bench in tma pi uh, fantastic judgment long one summary relate you know relevant to our discussion here is it said for most of the uh, aspects of running an educational institution minority and majority are same that's the summary of the judgment especially unaided institutions if a particular institution is not getting help from the state in any form then both are both majority schools and minority schools have the same rights okay so uh, i just want to pause here one second when i say majority schools minority schools uh, are, are you familiar with what that means because many people have this yeah so this is not a term invented by our group just to get some changes made here okay the constitution actually leads to the formation of this so called uh um, minority schools minority colleges and non minority schools non minority colleges and it's only based on the religion of the uh, trust i mean members of the trust that will run the 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 institution or if you simplify it religion of the management nothing else counts so if two thirds of the members of the managing trust managing committee of a school for example are uh, jains or parsis then it's a minority school if they are hindus it's a majority school a similar distinction exists on a linguistic basis also i think mohandas pai ji covered it very well and there is a similar thing but uh, he already made the point i'll i'll come to that again there also it's you know kind of uh, uh, not beneficial to hindus so this is actually encoded in the constitution it actually calls out if in fact you try to open a school you will realize it in the in the first few sections of the form only they'll ask you what is your religion or the religion of the committee how many are hindus how many are in effect they are asking that okay so it's not invented by us we are not i mean that we have heard that this this particular accusation a few times saying uh, 
you know, why do you want to classify schools on religious basis? We are not doing it. It already exists. And then Article 20. So this is uh, this was introduced to nullify that judgment which I spoke about, a 2002 judgment, which treated both institutions on equal footing with regard to uh, admission of students. You know, the state wanted to carve out a certain percentage of seats, and it said, I want to be able to say 10%, 15%, 20% of the seats will be determined by me. Then the, you know, there was an objection saying you can't do that for minority schools. There was a, you know, there was a doubt. And the judgment, while talking about that aspect, you know, the judgment covered a lot of things, but it said no. If it's an unaided minority uh, school, it's, uh, I mean, uh, and, and an unaided uh, majority, you, they are equal. But if it is an aided minority, the state can still interfere and say, you know, I have aided your, uh, the formation of your institution. So I can, you know, impose saying, you know, you keep 20% of your seats for whomever I determine. So they nullified it. They said the state shall have the power to, you know, uh, you know, uh, impose admission to educational institutions. I won't go into this word by word, but this whole first section that I'm highlighting here, right? The state grants itself the right to, you know, interfere in the matter of ad uh, admission. And then uh, look at this clause. It says any type of institution, whether aided or unaided by the state, the, the government can interfere other than the minority educational institutions. So they explicitly left it out. So this is again encoded saying we will not touch minority schools in terms of seats. Any other school we have the right. And this was to negate that judgment. This is one clause. The second clause we are going to talk about is no religious instruction shall be provided in any educational institution wholly maintained out of state funds. So on paper, this looks good, right? I mean, secular state cannot interfere in religion and then uh, uh, the, so therefore we will not teach. But today, 80, even today, I think 70 odd percent overall nationwide, 70 percent of the schools are government schools. And maybe 80, 85, I don't know, maybe even 90 plus percent of our kids go to, I mean, go have secular education because they want a job, they want skills. So we're literally saying a majority of our students go and spend the peak of their youth in institutions which shall not teach religion. And then we complain saying, you know, why are they, why, why, are, why don't they have any trace of dharmic attitude in them? I mean, we are setting them up for that. I mean, they have no clue. I mean, there, there, there is always this argument that we can teach it at home and all of that is fine. But the peak of their youth and the peak duration during that, the active time from let's say three or four years kid till about 18, he spends in schools and colleges and you know the exposure there is totally opposite. So we don't stand a chance unless we correct this, irrespective of what theories we come up with. There are some, I mean, there are some homeschooling theories and there are some theories saying culture and religion shall be taught by the parents. All of that is good. But if this deracination does not happen, only then that will be effective. Institutions like Art of Living, Isha Foundation, uh, they have started programs from the age of eight for children. Right. So it absolutely complements and supplements whatever is missing uh, in education. And I've seen in my own eyes, my own son, the way he is. Uh, right. Out. I think uh, the point there is for. No, the important point there for this discussion, right? is if we dig into how many of these institutions which are doing fantastic job, how are they managing to do it? It's an exemption through the linguistic route, I'm pretty sure. You know, a franchisee model or some other model they'll create because there is a loophole and you know, you put, so I'm from Karnataka, I'll fund the money, I'll create a committee, two thirds of the members are my friends who are Tamil or Telugu or some, you know, some other language and I grain, you know, and then I still need clout with the government. And then I declare myself as a linguistic minority, then I'm able to teach all of those. But the bigger problem there is, I mean, in our own nation, in our own state, why should we, you know, follow this route and how many can do it? Not everybody can do it. And then of course, uh, the kind of, at least my, in my opinion, the killer article in our constitution, which says all minorities, whether based on religion or language, shall have the right to establish and administer educational institutions of their choice. Absolutely nothing wrong with the way it is written, but everything wrong with the way it is interpreted. Okay, it says minorities shall get it. Courts and our governments have said only minorities will get it. It's almost inexplicable why somebody would interpret it that way unless you have 
you know some other agenda but that's how this has been interpreted so uh, there are various reasons that has led to deracination of hindus uh, banking on those three articles that i talked about at least the uh, two of them article 28 and 30 have been there since inception and uh, you know banking on, on on those systematically we've been deracinated helped by some of the initial you know people who are our education ministers so there's some clue here i think uh, you know whenever we share this material you can go and do some research on it on why we highlighted obviously there'll be a certain flavor to what gets highlighted and you know that's what we have tried here uh, try to show here industrial scale distortion of our history negation and then the opposite also glorification and you know highlighting of um, the rest and enormous patronization of pro left and pro minority academicians so therefore we are in a situation where formal education means deracination that's the that's what we, you know it's become so again very quickly so there was a phase in between where due to some inadvertent developments in our society we kind of started coming back on track so to say and some strange triggers right you know you all know uh, or maybe not the audience is mostly quite young so some of us at least you know we we've experienced this during the ramayana and mahabharata days streets used to be empty and coconuts getting broken in front of tv everybody starting to go to temples and to stop yeah and yeah i don't know how many lakhs of copies of ramayana mahabharata got sold and so on but they did serve their purpose there was like a at least a halt to the speed with which we were eroding and then they came back so they realized this and then you know from the 90s on onwards i think control was rested back again and uh, maybe in the, speaking on serial terms some of those really crap tv serials started taking over from that and you know made up for the loss of uh, you know whatever time they lost there so in our syllabus also therefore you know it's complete abramization there are some examples here you know uh, karnataka social science textbook and you know in terms of what they talk again it's fine i think we've talked about it a little bit sri lanka has a wonderful policy where they openly teach about all religions uh, to all kids they say let there be some basic groundwork done that's fine but if you look at this it doesn't look like you're teaching all religions here okay and there are numerous examples and this is just in you know some pages from the karnataka syllabus and uh, on on social media you will find so many threads and so many posts related to this yeah this is not social this is not science this is not social studies but <laughs> so this, yeah so this is religion you know say and this is all ncert and all schools and colleges will teach this and delhi also it is yeah i'm sure it's same throughout this is like ncert syllabus so whoever is adopting even state syllabuses many of them do this so again like i said right if you if the question is okay the birthplace of you know jesus christ is this is fine but if there's a birthplace of shankaracharya along with that then the child gets a neutral opinion on this a young kid but if the only question is this then over 15 years of training you know what will happen so it's not just in academics in you know cinemas i'm sure this is like a favorite topic you know uh, you know i have seen the one favorite example i would like to quote is in anyway, i'll not take the name but there's one series of comedy movies that comes and in that movie i've noticed every time there is at least like a 10 minute segment where there is some serious thing happening and the you know the leading lady is upset and things are bad and then they go to a church and pray you know throughout the in the comedy movie also they'll insert that so you you pick any you know mainstream movie i think there's no dispute at least on this fact on what they promote so fragmentation of uh, society has happened through this so the result of all of these is that our children are denied access to our own texts and civilizational knowledge i mean we know right in the uh, in the, the older system was that's the you know between 3 and or maybe between 5 to 18 is when the uh, child used to learn about our scriptures and shastras and dharma and now that's the exact phase where we will not teach them that so we're doing the opposite of what we are meant to do so what to do so there was this bhakti movement in the medieval ages shri tilak you know used many instruments to re uh, kindle uh, the spirit of dharma and like i mentioned the brief phase there so therefore if we don't rekindle it it's impossible to prevent its fragmentation so from a legal and constitutional angle to do all of this numerous steps are required from the legal angle what we are asking is repeal this article 15 5 make that clause applicable to all of them 
and then insert in article 28 nothing in nothing in this constitution shall be deemed to forbid the teaching of traditional indian knowledge so this is absolutely vital okay so there is this argument that you know the moment you start teaching uh, hindu kids about hindu religion sati may come back yeah weird arguments you know untouchability may come back sati may come back i mean we have given up on untouchability i mean uh, there are exceptions i don't deny it okay but as a larger society we have accepted that it's it's not acceptable and the question of sati was not you know it's minuscule problem even then our uh, scriptures our books will talk about you know be truthful ahimsa don't injure another person don't take money from another person i mean all the like i mentioned about the dharmic lakshanas if you teach kids about these how is it going to ke- create a problem in fact they be- they may become soft i would say that is a stronger argument if you want to argue against this not the argument currently being done and in article 30 which grants numerous rights replace the word minorities with all sections of citizens so very briefly i want to touch upon this article 30 right so there are three categories of powers that this article uh, grants what can you teach who will you teach and who will teach okay very very vital for any school or college any educational institution today the minority run educations have complete control and freedom to do all of those their syllabus they can decide they can choose to accept ncert or whatever or they can teach in addition any other subject they can decide on their principal headmaster teachers and they can decide whom to take so all three they have complete uh, freedom we do not have freedom on any of these so that's the you know it's like re, uh, really grave problem and just replacing one word will actually take care of it so we so we are requesting so you know there's a bit of a background uh, may 2019 elections are going to be due and we have one private member bill introduced by dr satyapal singh ji in 2016 which actually asks for the exact same thing that we have covered in this presentation you know amendments to five articles but it's a private member bill Uh, it had to be adopted by the government and then passed in both the lok sabha and rajya sabha we simply don't have any time left anymore though i think technically we have one small budget session still pending it's not going to happen so we've kind of i mean obviously we will not give up hope so we have revised our demand now what we are saying is in the new lok sabha term under the assumption that a uh, government favorable to these demands will come again in bracket uh, the again is in <laughs> bracket but uh, so we are saying please introduce either a government bill or if you want for whatever reasons you want to take an alternate approach go the private member approach bill approach again introduce it adopt it and please pass all of these amendments that we are requesting for so uh, one final notion will this be anti minority i think i need not explain this further right it's clear none of this is anti minority we're saying give them whatever you want we in fact like it please give us the same that's the summary of this slide and you know it also furthers the mission of rss uh, so i'll skip this and i'll go to this slide this is the appeal you know to all of you please write to the prime minister asking for an end to this discrimination write to your local mp mla whatever you know uh, email or note or whatever and ask them to read about hindu charter demands and you know maybe make some public statements give some public commitments if they agree with us and in try to get it included in their respective parties manifesto i mean we may not be able to do all of this together but in bits and pieces if you keep including at that level you know state governments and central governments this is possible we have a hindu charter website where there is a petition that you can sign where you know we want to collect at least a few lakhs of signatures and banking on that we want to go to some of these government authorities the prime minister president maybe and make a petition so please help us by signing please ask your friends and family to you know refer them to the website and ask them to sign and then you know we would really love if you can ar- help us arrange a hindu charter talk in your city so we've covered a few of the major cities there's still lot of work and so you know we are, uh, partly because we are not interested partly because we are not capable we, we you know there are there are no dharnas or protests related to these so it will only be the satvik way of doing things talks and conferences and so on so if you can join there and so the hindu charter.org i think srujan foundation is the best place to start off on this so from there uh, you know any of this can be done but uh, that would be another important activity we solicit your help on i read a statement from javadekar who said that 
very soon there will be a draft bill for re education policy. New, new education policy, yeah. Which will be open for discussion, but implemented right. by the next government. Yeah. It may include all these things. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, yeah, that's like, you are a very, very optimistic person, I'll say. <laughs>